We're going to talk about the decisions made by the apostles of that time and the conclusions drawn out of those decisions by the fathers of the church. It turns out their point of view differ. Hallelujah, we agreed to build the sanctuary. Today's topic is Tabernacle of David, Rebuilding the Tabernacle of David. I believe it is a very relevant topic, particularly for now, particularly for these days, particularly for Armenia, particularly for Israel and all believers on the surface of the earth. And the reason I believe this topic is so relevant is because it talks about the relationship within the body of Messiah between the people and the nations, between Israel and the Church of Gentiles. And this topic is woven throughout the entire Bible, from the very beginning to the book of Revelation. I will give you three verses. The first is Exodus chapter 25, verse 8. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst, the condition God places upon his people. If you want me to be in your midst, and if you want me to fill with my spirit your gatherings, and each of you, you must make me a sanctuary. This is the first condition, and it talks about the tabernacle. We're talking about restoring the tabernacle of David. And the second verse is Amos chapter 9, verse 11. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, a prophecy connecting God's design with its fulfillment. Third verse I'd like to bring to your attention is Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and God will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. These are just three verses of the Bible, and there are a lot more of them, that show that from the very beginning God has a design. And he's not the one who reacts to things. Oh, something's gone out of control and we need to bring in plan B or C or that we need to fix it somehow. He's not the one who says, I failed it with this group, let's do it with another. No, God from the very beginning knows what he's doing. From the very beginning he tells Adam of his plans and then we see throughout the Bible how step by step he makes his will come true. And we know that there isn't such a force that can ever be able to stand on his way. And if God wills to do something, and such a force tries to stand on his way, it just doesn't happen. Do you agree with me? Hallelujah, we all agree. That is good. Two pillars of the tabernacle of David. So the first pillar is worship, and this is something that was very fashionable to teach in some of the Christian denominations some time ago, that the rebuilding of Tabernacle of David meant rebuilding of worship, as a worship pleasing to God. That's what Jesus was teaching. When asked what was the highest commandment, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So, with all you have, with your entire creativity, if we're talking about artists, and I'm an artist, so it is close to my heart, and when I say an artist, I mean a creative person in all senses of the word. For any man, particularly a believer, God sees them as a creative person. Do you agree with me? Because to each of us, he gave us the gift of faith. But our faith is very creative, in the sense that it creates. For if we believe with the faith that does not change us or anything around us, as our Jewish sages say, if you'd like to change the world, change yourself. So the way it works is that the light starts shining within you. The more the light shines changing you, the more the light spreads around you. 
and that light is the light of your heart. And the more the light shines around you onto the people, the more people come into the light. So they start making better decisions and better choices. So it is possible to change the world if you start with yourself. And that is a very efficient way. But today we will be talking about the second pillar of the Tabernacle of David. And as you can see, this horizontal line so the first pillar of worship of God is the relationship between man and God and it is a vertical line then what we're going to talk now about is is the horizontal line and that is the relationship between the believers between the churches between denominations between people between church and Israel it is the anatomy of the body of Messiah, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So let's take the well-known event from the Book of Acts, the Apostles gathering in Jerusalem. It is preceded by a discourse the Apostle Paul had with other disciples of Jesus, holding to the teaching of Pharisees. By the way, Paul himself admitted that he was holding to the teaching of the Pharisees. So these disciples, disciples holding to teachings of Pharisees, insisted that all Gentile believers must be cut, but cut not to death, but in the Jewish understanding of the word, that they should be circumcised and keep the law. That was the demand of the disciples of Jesus of the teaching of Pharisees. So Paul, who was also a Pharisee, said, I do have a Holy Spirit in me too, but I am against it. So with these varying views, they came to the apostolic gathering in Jerusalem. So the apostles gathered, and it says, upon much discussion. And why does it say, upon much discussion? And that is not by coincidence. Because this was a new type of question. Because up to that point, the law was very definite. If you'd like to come and worship the God of Israel, yes, you may, but you must be circumcised and you must keep the law. And then welcome to join us. In other words, you must become Israel. But Paul received a revelation, and other disciples received the revelation. Peter is telling about the miracles happening amongst the Gentiles, and Paul is talking about the same thing. They all saw how God, with his Holy Spirit, is filling the Gentiles. The Gentiles are not circumcised, they do not keep the law, but the apostles saw with their own eyes how the God was feeling the Gentiles with his Holy Spirit, and as a result, they start speaking in tongues, they start praying for healing, and other gifts of the Holy Spirit are in operation amongst the Gentiles. The strong evidence that the God has received them. Simon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with these, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. Words were spoken by James, who was then the leader of Jewish nobility. He was the most orthodox amongst all the apostles. He was Jew of the Jews, the orthodox to the very last letter. James references prophet Amos's words. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. So this last verse, verse 18, known from old, are very important. I have talked about this before, and I'd like to draw your attention to this again. God from the very beginning has a plan. He is not like men. Very often we find ourselves sitting in one situation waiting for the next situation to happen. And when the situation happens and something aggravates us in it, we are reacting to it passively. We either hide or protect ourselves from it. God does not react passively. From the very beginning, he has a plan, and he makes sure the plan happens. And if you'd like to participate in this plan, you will be within it. And if we don't want to participate in it, he will do it without us. And it's a great pity if we do not want to walk in our calling, because the calling on each of us is unique. 
and nobody can do what we are called to do. We're talking about restoring the tabernacle of David. So when the apostles are gathering to talk about it, the main verses for them are the words of prophet Amos. If you remember, when the apostles went to share the good news, they would come into the fellowship, open the scriptures, and then see if what they're saying relates to the scriptures. So anything the apostles said be compared to the scriptures. Even Apostle Paul in Galatians 1 verses 8 and 9 would say, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. So the apostles found the verse in the Bible that resolves their contradictions. Once again, as I mentioned before, Torah or the law is quite definite that if you want to worship God of Israel, you must keep the law. So the verse from prophet Amos about restoring the tabernacle of David spoke to them in such a way found that God would receive the Gentiles without being circumcised or without keeping the law. Now we're going to look at why they came to such conclusions. There are several words that are used in the scripture to describe the sanctuary. There are various words in Russian and there are various words in Hebrew. They're all good words. For example, the dwelling place is translated as Mishkan, or Migdash as a sanctuary, Kadesh as a sanctuary, Ehal as a temple or palace, Seter as a hut, Milona as a lodge, and Ohel as a tent. But when we talk about the tabernacle of David, a completely different word is used. In Hebrew, a completely different word is used. And when we look at any other translation, that nuance is lost in those translations. But for us, this particular word and this particular difference is very important for us. A word sukkah is used for that purpose. In Hebrew, it is sukkah. In English, it is often translated as booths. So when a Jewish man hears the word sukkah, then as it is in the Jewish tradition, the tabernacle of David is related to the Sukkah and the Feast of Sukkot, or the Feast of Booths. It is a feast of building the booths. What verses in the New Testament do you remember that are related to the Sukkot? James, Peter, John, when Jesus takes them to the mountain and Elijah and Moses appear to them. Do you remember? And Peter says, so good for us to be here. If you wish, we will put up three booths, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Why was he talking about building the booths? So you know, the Jews built the houses from the stone, because we have plenty of them. As for the wood, we don't have much of the wood to use it as building materials. We have palm trees, but they're not good for building. The reason Peter was offering to build booths is because he was talking about the Feast of Booths, or Sukkot. The second instance, if you remember when Jesus on the last big day, in Hebrew it is called Oshana Rabbah, or the Great Salvation, Jesus stood up and announced. Do you remember what he said? If you remember, in the beginning it said there was a Feast of Booths coming up. All who are thirsty, come to me and drink. There is a Jewish tradition to pour water on the altar on the last day. The water from the pool of Siloam was brought and poured out before the Lord on the altar. So the Feast of Booths was celebrated for seven days, and every day there was a sacrifice made. Altogether there were 70 of them, for 70 nations. Noah begot 70 people, and out of those 70, all nations of the world came to be. Another explanation of number 70 is that 70 in Jewish tradition means fullness of. So the 70 means for all of them, all of the people. In other words, if you wanted to make a sacrifice for all the nations, then you would make the 70 sacrifices. Coming back to the tabernacle of David, 
In Hebrew, it is called Sukkot David, the Tabernacle of David being restored by God. So the word Sukkah, or the meaning of the root of the word, is very well conveyed in Psalm 139. 13. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. So this word, to knit together, to cover over, to join together, to set, similarly to a weaver weaving a carpet. In the same fashion, God out of the branches, and branches are us, weaving his tabernacle, his sanctuary. This is I, and I'm slightly younger, and I'm sewing off the branches to build the sukkah as it is written. It is very important. This is my and Veta's booth, or tent, or sukkah, in our courtyard. They all differ depending on inspiration by God. But we are artists and we let our creativity loose. The commandments on what and how to build are given in at least two verses of the Bible. One is Levites chapter 23, but I'd like to draw your attention to the book of Prophet Nehemiah chapter 8. And that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout the towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make temporary shelters, as it is written. Very important point, to make it as it is written, meaning as it is given in the law. You cannot make it whichever way you like, you must make it the way you were told. You cannot find any information on how it should be built or how the branches should be woven. All that is given to us is the list of trees that must be used in constructing the tabernacle. Pay attention to how it says, take the branches from olive and wild olive trees. It reminds us of the, of the writings of Apostle Paul when he talks about wild olive and olive tree, natural branches and wild branches. What is the tzimus of this situation, or as, as we say, important nuances of this? Why we're not talking about the constructions, the way we build it? For example, we build it this way, others build it differently. Why the importance is placed on the use of various types of trees? A very important nuance, various trees. In the Bible, we can find a reference to the trees as to the nations. Various trees, various nations. Trees, indeed, are very telling symbols. It has a trunk out of which various branches come. Those branches branch out even more, the same as the nations branch out into tribes, the clans, the families, and each of them has a, its own leaves and its own berries. It paints a good picture of a nation. Each tree has its own fruit, its own scent. If you gather your things and come with me tomorrow to Israel, you still will be able to catch some scents that are left by the trees. Citrus trees, jasmine trees, myrtles and others. Also, each tree has its own function. One tree is used for construction, another tree is used for medicinal purposes, another tree is used for making resin, and the fourth type of tree has such a good structure that is used for making duduk. Duduk is an Armenian flute. And duduk can be made only out of this type of tree. Do you understand? Do you understand what I'm hinting at? So if we're talking about the Tabernacle of David, and David was an artist, he started as a musician and he finished as a musician. Throughout his life he was operating in various functions, including being a king, amongst others. But he always was a musician who left behind a whole book of Psalms. He was also a poet. Also, he received a lot of revelation and I wrote them down as the commandments on how to minister as priests in the temple. But now we're talking about how he realized his ideas in the temple. 
He did not build the temple, as you remember, his son Solomon did it. But we read very clearly that he uh, gave to Solomon a model of the temple that he received directly from God. Look at what Solomon did in carrying out the will of his father. And he adds to the temple something that makes it different from the tabernacle of Moses. He adds to the temple the external court for the Gentiles. And it's an interesting fact that at that time was considered a revolution. Second Chronicles chapter 6, from verse 29 he talks about the Israelites, and from verse 32 he says, As for the foreigner who does not belong to your people Israel, but has come from a distant land because of your great name and your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when they come and pray towards the temple, then hear from heaven your dwelling place. Do whatever the foreigner asks of you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your own people Israel, and may know that this house I have built bears your name. So he follows in the footsteps of his father, and he says, it turns out, and this was, that was so revolutionary about this prayer, because who are the foreigners anyway. Get circumcised, keep the law, become Israel, and you're welcome to join us. No problem. But Solomon's praying that the foreigner who isn't circumcised, who isn't keeping the law, but he comes from the land far away for his name's sake, and they come to this outer court, so he prays that God would receive this foreigner and would hear his prayers. So David and Solomon, with architectural means through the construction of the temple, realized the idea of construction of the tabernacle from various types of wood, the natural olive and the wild olive coming together. So if you remember the description of the holy place, let's look inside. Inside of the holy place, various trees, flowers were carved out, even the cherubims, and they all were covered in gold. In building the temple, three types of wood were used – olives, cypress and cedar. The interior of the temple was like a hut woven together with branches of different trees. Some poets would compare the booth to the garden, the Garden of Eden cherubims between the trees, the flowers, and so forth. Even in the Garden of Eden, we see the various trees growing together. And I don't think it's a coincidence. And King David, through various architectural means and instruments, conveys this very idea. Apostle Paul later on states that even what David understood wasn't quite it and that it was revealed to him, to Apostle Paul, what Paul called the mystery of God's household. That is from the Romans chapter 11, when we were talking about the wild olive and olive, and Paul was talking about wild branches being grafted in. Paul was a rabbi, and that means an artist the music of whom not everyone understood. If you remember, Peter was talking about letters of Paul not being easily understood. But what Paul says is very important. Paul draws the same picture of the tabernacle, but this time as a tree. Try to engage your imagination. The booth or the tabernacle as a tree. So the trunk of the tree originates in the word of the Almighty God, but the crown of the tree consists of many different branches, including engrafted ones, and they all bring their own fruit. Paul says, my understanding of the mystery of Christ, and it is about dispensation or administration of God's grace, which was not made known to men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets explaining what apostles had understood before, when James rose up and said, In that day will I restore the tabernacle of David that has fallen. And then he continues that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ. Paul emphasizes that there is Israel and there are Gentiles who inherit the promises of God as well. And he says, please pay attention, fellow heirs and partakers. These words mean that you're not the only one, but there's someone else beside you, at least you are two. 
Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Remember we build a tabernacle, a sukkah, which should be made of branches and boughs of different trees. Here he talks about this principle of different trees. Verse 18. Is any man called being circumcised? Circumcised meant Jew in the ancient times, uncircumcised meant Gentile. So here he says, is any man called being circumcised, let him not become uncircumcised. It means if you are Jew and you are called by God, then do not stop being a Jew. Is anyone called in uncircumcision, let him not be circumcised. In other words, if you are not a Jew and you are called by God, you don't need to become a Jew, you don't need to become Israel. Look, at the Apostolic Council, the Apostles had discussed and argued on this topic a lot. For them it was impossible. Yes, their eyes saw that God had accepted Gentiles. But if they could not find in the Torah that God has willed that from the very beginning, then they would simply say anathema. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Even Apostle Paul was saying if someone comes with a different gospel, anathema. Then he continues that circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Circumcision does not save you, but being uncircumcised doesn't save you either. Is that clear? So Paul says both do not matter. In what sense they do not matter? In the sense that your salvation does not depend on it. What's more important is keeping God's commandments. Remember when Jesus says to Peter, come with me. And Peter understands that Jesus is not calling him to a party. And he says, what about him? And Peter points to John. Isn't he coming along? To what Jesus replies, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. So you do well when you come with me, and he will do well when he remains. By the same token, the same principle applies when Paul says, if you are called circumcised, then remain circumcised. And those who are called uncircumcised, there is no need for them to be circumcised. God's not going to love you more if you get circumcised. You're not going to be saved if you get circumcised. You're only going to be saved by faith. Do as God tells you to do. And then he finishes with, each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. In other words, if you're called to be a pear, don't try to become an apple. And if you are called to be an apricot, then you can give to the world the duk, the Armenian flute. So that's how apostles decided, but it turns out that to each verse of the Bible and the decision of the apostles, there is a different view. Now we're talking about the decisions that were made by the apostles of that time, the Jews, and the conclusions the fathers of the church made based on those decisions. It turns out their points of view differ. The Apostles viewed the decisions of the Apostolic Council in restoring the Tabernacle of David the following. First of all, they saw unification. Unification of what, you may ask? Unification of the people who kept the law with the people who did not keep the law, i.e. uncircumcised people. Again, for the Jewish mind, that was incredible, because the Jews were not to mix with, or fellowship with, with the Gentiles. Here, God says, it's going to be this way. And it's not as if God first decided one way and then he changed his mind. So the Apostle found through Prophet Amos that tabernacle or sukkah or the tent or the sanctuary that it must be built out of branches of different trees. And this is the key point. It turns out they received a revelation that God had this in mind from the very beginning, that they will be circumcised and uncircumcised together and each of them will have their own calling and they will be unified in one sanctuary. During the time of Apostles, the Gospel was spread with the speed of the forest fire. It literally covered the whole empire. But and now I know that you choose to go to Turkey, to Iran, you go to different countries, and where are you going? Yes, you are going to Diaspora, where Armenians live, and you bring them the good news. 
you bring life to that place. And in doing so, you do exactly the same work as the apostles did. Apostles went to the diaspora, only to the places where diaspora was, the Jewish diaspora. They would preach in synagogues, and then they would separate those who believed. Then those believers were joined by the Gentiles, Syrians, Greeks, Armenians, Iranians, and a congregation would be formed. And that early church congregations would be made of two groups, two branches. The Jews, because the apostles were preaching in synagogues first, and the Gentiles who joined those Jews. Who believed. We read from the book of Acts and we read in the church history that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were expressed in the great power. Remember, even the shadow of Peter was healing people and they would lay their hands and the demons would flee. One of the historians of early church from the second century wrote that he visited all large cities of the Roman Empire and he found that that the congregations of the disciples of Jesus, consisting of both Jews and Gentiles, were studying the teaching of the Apostles. There was unity in the teaching and the congregations of that time were the whole sanctuary that was the tabernacle of David being restored by God. So you wouldn't think that I'm just making up some Jewish stories. I'd like to show you this mosaic from Rome, the beginning of the 5th century. On the bottom you see the full mosaic as it is, and on the top you see the two fragments, two women. Both Veta and I were there personally, and we can attest to the authenticity of this picture. The most interesting thing about this mosaic is the two inscriptions on the bottom of both parts of the mosaic. Underneath the lady on the left, the inscription says Ecclesia ex circumcisione in Latin. That means Ecclesia made out of circumcised. As for the lady on the right, the inscription says Ecclesia of Gentibus. Gentibus meaning Gentiles, that is Ecclesia made out of Gentiles. The mosaic is found in the basilica dedicated to two saints, two women, one Syrian Jew called Serapia, another lady is Sabina, a noble woman from Rome. Serapia was a believer, she was a disciple of Jesus, who sold herself into slavery, though she was a very rich woman, that sold herself into slavery so she could share the gospel with people. She'd find herself in someone's house and she would start sharing the gospel with both master and slaves. Sabina was her master, uh, who also believed, and both of them were executed some time ago. So what I'm trying to say is that this illustration is from the 5th century. Does someone remember when Nicene Council under Constantine took place? Yes, that's right, it was the 4th century, beginning of the 4th century. And the mosaic is from the 5th century. The Nicene Council under Constantine, amongst good things, was also anti-Semitic. That's where they decided to separate themselves from everything Jewish. So this mosaic from the 5th century bears some sort of a memory that the Ecclesia or the Congregation of God consists of circumcised and uncircumcised. That's the fact given to us as a mosaic. Coming back to the Tabernacle of David, we are building it, and it's called Tabernacle of David or David's Sukkah or David's Sanctuary that is built of branches of different trees. But the fathers of the church understood the decisions of the apostles differently. If the apostles understood and interpreted this decision as unification, meaning how to bring those who eat kosher food and those who eat non-kosher food, some would eat pork and others wouldn't, how to bring them together, and it looked impossible. That's why the apostles interpreted Prophet Amos's word as unification, bringing the various branches together, whereas the fathers of the church saw this as a way to, to separate those branches. 
and they interpreted the decision of the Council as the final separation or breaking away from the Jewish fetters. What were the consequences of such interpretation? Israel and Church divided, the fathers of the Church refused the sources of the Christian faith, the Old Testament becomes nominal, it starts being interpreted allegorically as shadows, as something that just about to be thrown away. But even if we follow this metaphor of just about to be thrown away, well, we won't go into it now, as it is a different topic. But when Paul says just about, he means just about everything will be finished. He was slightly mistaken because he's just about now actually lasted 2,000 years. What else has been happening in the last 1,500 years or slightly more with the body of Messiah? The replacement theory comes about. What is the replacement theory? It's when the church says Israel misbehaved, God got offended with Israel and is not going to deal with him any longer. And now us Gentiles are the good ones, Gentiles who believed in Jesus, and we replaced Israel. So all blessings of Israel became ours, all curses of Israel remained with them. So that's replacement theory in two words. Another consequence that you're all very familiar with are religious wars, incessant religious wars. Bloody wars, not just theoretical wars. Bloody wars between denominations and between Christian nations. The number of people that died in those wars between Christian denominations was staggering, that even the Jews were no longer on the agenda. They were too busy killing off each other. So these are the consequences of the conclusions of the fathers of the church who saw the decisions of the apostles as separation, not unification. Again, we're talking about restoring the tabernacle of David. Why has it become so relevant, particularly now? The year 1948, the situation drastically changes. For those who are not asleep, this was a major shake-up. People begin to understand, particularly because of the wars that Israel starts to fight when the neighboring countries attack Israel, including the war for independence, and we are still warring for our independence. I know you understand what I'm talking about because you probably are fighting here and there as well. And in these wars, Israel begins to receive miraculous victories. So Israel that doesn't have industry, nor the army, nor the weapons, literally close to nothing. There are various documentaries about the wars of independence where Arab soldiers were interviewed. I saw some of these stories. For example, about the Syrian soldiers who were in trenches uh, fighting against Israel, and all of a sudden they saw this massive, colossal figure that was extending all the way to the skies, and they start running away in horror, screaming, Ibrahim, Ibrahim. Ibrahim means Abraham in Arabic. And they would run in different directions because of the great fear that would come upon them. Such witness stories abound. So Christians saw that God's hand was upon Israel. That's why Israel was having these supernatural victories. In the same fashion as apostles during early church saw that Holy Spirit was descending upon the Gentiles and God was receiving them as his own people, that for the apostles was just as incredible and unexplainable. And they were looking for explanation, but they realized that it wasn't fitting in the realms of the natural. Now, with the establishment of Israel, we see the similar situation, but the mirrored situation, that the church looks at Israel and it cannot be denied because here it is, it exists. 
So the apostles gathered and said, we need to do something about this incredible thing that is happening in front of our eyes. Again, we are talking about restoring the tabernacle of David, that from the very beginning, God designed as the place of gathering of various trees, various ministries, various callings. It's the same as it cannot be that in the human body, all organs are stomachs. So Paul talks about it when he says, if there is an ear, then where is an eye? When he talks about congregation and likens it to the body that has different organs. So if various trees are like various organs in the body of Christ, each has its own fruit, each has its own calling. One is being used for building, another one is used for medicinal purposes, another one gives gum or resin, the fourth one is used to make baskets out of and so forth because there isn't a useless tree and each tree has its own beauty has its own scent and its own fruit and if we want to rebuild the tabernacle of david we should realize that we cannot build it whichever way we want to or as we see it fit but we need to build it as it is written it must be built out of different types of trees and it is a very important condition. So if we want God to dwell amongst us, we must build him a sanctuary. If we are building the sanctuary, we must understand that we must build it the way he wants us to build it, meaning as it is written and out of different types of wood or trees. And if we understand that, then we must understand also that the calling of each nation is also a responsibility upon each nation before the Lord to bring the fruit that God willed for this nation to bring. If you remember, the book of Revelation says that each nation will bring to heavenly Jerusalem its honor and glory. Friends, we came to build a sanctuary for God together with you. It is our desire.